Well, I'll talk about a little bit about the belief versus them also being internally skeptical too. So I was just going to say anyway, then here, if a medium who's giving a voice to a spirit, I think in that whole spiritual era when they're doing the seances, there's definitely some people doing the seances that are, have a thing rigged up so that they, they knock the table underneath and they're doing a scam. There's a bunch of people sitting around at, in these parties um, who you know, are doing a Ouija board and they really think that they're actually getting messages, right? Yep. Um, and likewise, people looking into the seer stone they are envisioning they believe their own what their you know their own thing that they're looking for they're sending themselves into this kind of visionary trance whether whether you want to you know whatever you want to describe about how uh, anyway that your own visions of the uh, spirit world or, or its non-existence so they know there's more to the art like i say than they let on to the audience and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're just simply lying cynics up and down. So often they believe in the magic, even if they know that some of what they're doing is a trick. Got it. So um, I'm going to say suggested, like I say, that when Joseph Sr. is about to lose his farm in 1825, he takes his son on a money digging expedition, which fails and leads to him losing his farm. Um, I, you know, if you don't believe in money digging, you know, this wasn't the smartest thing in the world to do. Um, it, he isn't the smartest guy in the world, but anyway, that's what he does. But I'm going to argue then that even more remarkable um, if if Joseph Jr. doesn't believe in money digging and he doesn't believe in being able to kind of see where the kind of buried treasure are and all this, when he's later um, church president and he's trying to solve this just massive debt that has occurred because of um, them building the Kirtland Temple, which is so much more than they could afford and everything else, um, he, in 1836, takes a bunch of core leaders of the church to Salem, Massachusetts to find um, what he's foreseen as a treasure that's buried in the basement of a house, uh, which doesn't end up being there and it fails. And it actually ends up, they never, they're not only, you know, they're wasting time um, on a treasure hunt. Which, why is he doing that if he knows that there's no treasure? You know, I mean, is it, is it, I don't, you know, ultimately, again, just like his dad, they end up having, they lose everything, they go bankrupt and they have to flee. Uh, the flee the states, you know, because of that. So, so it sounds like you believe that Joseph Smith Senior and possibly Joseph Smith Junior believe some or all of the underpinnings of of this treasure seeking. Yeah. So I think that they think that there's treasures. I think he wrote it into the Book of Mormon because he believes it too. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, that that's there, and so believes in, I think he also believes in the slippery stuff. Um, but on the other hand, I think that he well, and maybe I have it next slide. So, so here's the next slide. <laughs> but on the other hand, I'm gonna suggest that we have more than one voice in us. So whereas one of these, um, if you've seen, I don't know if you've seen this movie, this kid's movie, <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> so anyway, whereas these different voices are all speaking inside and one of these voices may well say, you're the greatest, you're a seer, you have all of these powers that, the, that God's given you. Uh, there might be a voice that says, but you never can find anything, you're just making it up. <laughs> Uh, you know, we, 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 all of these things, maybe it doesn't actually work. So I think that in fact, you know, there are all kinds of interior voices that we hold and we can actually hold inside of ourselves mutually contradictory things. And Got so, it. I mean, one of my favorite ones is that happens in Star Trek as well. <laughs> so anyway, Which you know, they, they encounter yeah, one of the Star Trek episodes, they, as an example, they go and they find an archeological thing about a society. It's this, uh, this thing that where each one of the persons, what they shows is that inside the, inside the representation of their self and their psyche, there's all the little ones inside, right? Inside the curl and this goes, because there's all the voices that make up, you know, your internal contradictions, right? Got it. So I'm gonna suggest that whereas, although some people do, that the very few people see themselves uh, you know, like, you know, I'm a villain and they're doing the, um, I don't know, I think even actually a lot of the James Bond villains don't think of themselves as villains, but maybe some of them do, you know, literarily. So people um, out from the outside, as we are looking at other people, we see them as conscious frauds, maybe with deliberate plots consciously to deceive, but very few people tend to view themselves that way and instead justify their deceptions as white lies told with good intentions and chronic liars, you know, often believe their own lies first. And so I've had um, friends who I think of as just being just complete. Um, I'm not, this is not, I'm not suggesting that Joseph Sr. or Joseph Jr. are, are uh, pathological liars or something like that, but I'm saying even in the case of a pathological liar, uh, that they often do, you know, they often believe their own lie first. I've had people do just outrageous, you know, like things where they lie, 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 all the way up to, um, you know, where they get just completely caught in the lie. <laughs> Uh, and 
And it's amazing because I think, how could you ever have allowed you to go this far? Because once they get to the cut moment, there's just nothing that can be done. And they're just there like this. And, you know, <laughs> so, and I think it's because they're, they're, they're believing themselves, you know, at some level. Otherwise, why would they go down that path? Why would you go do that money digging thing that you didn't have to it's, go do? It's kind of like the noble eye uh, or the, uh, I don't know, Dan Vogel call, has a, the prophet, like, what does he call it? The pious fraud, right? It's this idea that there's actually deep, deep, deep down there's truth, but sometimes you got to use deception to get people to the truth. Is that right? Yeah. And so I think that, I think that there's also, like you say, uh, in Dan's sense of an actual pious fraud, so where the person actually even is viewing themselves as a fraud and they know that they are. On the other hand, I'm actually even going to argue that even though there's one of your little voices in there that knows that, that there's a whole chorus of voices that maybe are saying something quite different, you know, that, and that we should also be aware of the other voices. Got it. And so I think that in that same sense of what you're talking about, that one of these key texts for understanding Joseph Smith is this one of the essentially most famous, um, you know, sequence in the Book of Mormon, which is in um, Community of Christ, First Nephi, chapter one, verses 113 to 115, which is the LDS version, chapter four, verses 12 to 13. And it came to pass that the Spirit said unto me again, slay him, uh, slay Laban. For the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands. Behold, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth his righteous purposes. It is better that one man should perish than a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. So, you know, this is a, you know, a, a key, huge argument for good ends justify bad means, right? So in this case, it's the, it's the extreme one case. You're going to murder somebody in their sleep, uh, but because of this very good end that you want to achieve, right? Yep. And those come from just voices in the head that we can call the spirit, but really, how do you know when it's the spirit versus just your head, right? Well, yeah, it could be. I mean, it's literary. So if that sp the spirit here is literary. Yeah. But yes, um, and so so yeah, I'm not necessarily. It, it could be a voice in the head for that. Anyway, it doesn't. We don't have to even assume a voice in the head because it's literary as opposed to um, anyway oh, right, as opposed right. to a, a testimony, right? But I'm just suggesting that in terms of the the overall um, whether there's a voice or not, the overall um, philosophical thing is the same underground underlying it, which is the principle of whether you know you can do some really bad thing like murder somebody if it's going to have amazing consequences you see so you go back in time and kill baby hitler you know or something like that because you know what all the bad things are gonna happen so he's still it still hasn't done all of those you know um things that are going to lead to that to what where he ultimately ends up being but you kill him as a when he's still an eight-year-old and therefore you know as innocent as you can be right right so anyway, if you can justify that kind of a extreme case, then I think that you can also ultimately justify this, which is to say, um, when you are being called out a bunch of times again and again and again after four years, that um, people want to have some kind of proof that um, these plates that you've been talking about um, are real and physical in some tangible way, that uh, you are able to give them a prop of a box that they can heft, uh, in order to even know you know that there's no actual physical gold plates inside the box. So in other words, you have done this, you've followed the the same precept that is in um, uh, in the Book of Mormon itself, which is there is an incredibly good end, if you believe that. Uh, I mean, I think that the book is trying to, it does believe that, the author of the book, that there's an incredibly good end here, and that's going to justify a couple little um, petty deceptions. So, Got it. Yep. Um, and so just as ironically, I'll just mention, since so much of the Book of Mormon is simply um, comes directly from the Bible, it's sort of ironic that the source of this text is actually um, from a particular place in the Gospel of John, where we read um, uh, that there is this conspiracy. Um, this is not a historical conspiracy, but it's one that's told in the, um, the Gospel of John's description. It's a conspiracy between the Sadducees and the Pharisees to kill Jesus. And so when we read it there, it says in John 11, 49 to 50, uh, and one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest of the same year, said unto them, ye know nothing at all, nor, uh, I'm recovering my text here. Okay, yeah. Or consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. So in other words, it's better here that we kill Jesus 
um, you know, so that one man is going to die uh, rather than the whole nation perish. And so even though, though, um, this is a, quoted as a, essentially or reworked as an affirmative uh, statement. So in other words, that it, we should be killing one guy so that the nation doesn't perish. In fact, in the biblical texts, the evangelist here is actually saying the opposite. In other words, that the high priest here is immoral for making this immoral argument, right? So in other words, this isn't the teaching of Jesus or Christ or God the way it is in, in the Book of Mormon. It's actually the opposite, right? So it got flipped so, somehow. Uh, Antichrist conspiracy. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so anyway, as we're kind of um, drawing to, you know, like, you know, pull this all together, a lot of times when we are talking about Joseph Smith's um, treasure seeker or folk magic seer background, there is kind of a sense, well, you know, when he was, when he was young or whatever, he was maybe involved in this kind of folk magic because his dad got him into it or whatever. But then by the, by a certain point he started having, he had some visions of God and, and actual angels and things like that. And then he became something quite different, a religious seer. But the, um, the actual, and so that'll, for example, in rough stone rolling, um, the way that that sort of accomplished is all the treasure digging stuff can kind of just be put off in its own little chapter. And then it's therefore not part of the, the actual narrative of the rest because we've already dealt with it and we aren't, we aren't just intertwining it the way it is in the actual chronology. But I just, anyway, this is a very simple um, timeline that I strung together here. That's just showing how essentially um, the treasure seer, Joseph Smith treasure seer, Joseph Smith religious seer is entirely intertwined, you know? So depending on what the dating for it is, you know, in spring of 1820, uh, Joseph Jr. has a vision that's later remembered as what's called the first vision. It wasn't called that at the time. We call it that now. Um, in that same time period, his contemporaries say that he has been leading um, a money digging company all around Palmyra for then in the next couple of years. So right at the time of the first vision and there, thereafter there's money digging going on. Um, you mentioned the finding of the brown seer stone while digging at the chase as well. That's then two years later in 1822. So the next year is the year, so while that, after he has that steer stone in September 22nd, so on this magic date, the, um, the autumnal equinox, uh, he has a vision of a spirit who shows him the location of buried gold plates, and he visits that, uh, and we'll see, then I wrote it here one, two, three, four, five times. He may not have actually done it every time. He later reports that, or it's later reported that he visited every every year on that same kind of magic date of the autumnal equinox. Um, but because of different um, failures to appease the spirit in different ways, he came with either bring the right person. So it's the first, the second year he was supposed to have brought Alvin, but Alvin died. Uh, then, the, then ultimately he decides that the person that he was supposed to have bring is is Emma, and so he brings her there on the fifth time. Or he comes and he and he has the uh, has greed in his heart, and so therefore he hasn't approached it with the right um, the right sense. And so then the spirit, the the plates, if he's a ten, if he's grabbed them, they suddenly are back in the uh, in the in the box, right? So this whole Book of Mormon narrative is drenched in the folklore from the very yeah. date dates he's claiming to have these visions with the spirits protecting the treasure, which is Moroni or Nephi. Yeah whatever name he's using at the time, he's doing it on a, a, a very well-known date of folklore, right? Sure. And these treasures are being guarded, protected by a spirit, which fits with the Captain Kidd, Benjamin Franklin sort of narrative of the treasure being protected by spirits. And they're even being withdrawn, right? Um, right. So that's just, it's the whole Book of Mormon narrative as it's originally being told or happening is being drenched with this uh, folk magic treasure digging stuff. It's, right. it's, it's it comes out of it. It doesn't appear yeah. whole cloth. It comes out of right. Right. It's the same exact context, you know. And so, and and by the way, and I'm also showing like here timeline wise, it's exactly the same time as all the rest of the money digging time, <laughs> you know. So it's it's on the one hand exactly the same kind of experience. And on the other hand, it's also this time period when he's busily engaged in money digging and scrying um, in a secular sense, if you want to call it that, essentially in a folk magic sense. It's not really secular. So anyway, the, um, you know, so again, he gets the, uh, right after that vision of the first vision of the Moroni and the, and the second one where he isn't able to achieve the plates, 
And the third, then in 1825, you know, he's part of uh, the money digging company with his father, downboarding at the Hales where he meets Emma, that ultimately uh, um, results in their elopement, but essentially he's down there because they're money diggers. Um, you know, in the next year in March 1826, that's when he's up in South Bainbridge in the Colesville area, the area where, you know, one of the, the Colesville branches ultimately organized. You know, he's tried in court as a uh, disrupt, disorderly person, as a glass looker, as a person who is deceiving essentially the, the Knight uh, family for, uh, about, um, you know, uh, whether or not he can see, find, find hidden treasure. Um, and essentially the testimony, um, you know, that the, uh, the Joseph Knight has is that, you know, no, he, no, he, he does, he does claim that he can do that, but it's actually true, you know, and so this is a problem for the, for the, actually the defense, because um, there's no, the New York state law at the time doesn't make any distinction between an actual uh, seer and a, one who's, you know, a fraud. <laughs> it's both of it's illegal. So anyway, so he ends up having to leave, um, you know, leave town on leg bail, which is to say they, they take him, you know, like, don't, you know, leave the county and we won't, we won't bug you. Um, you know, from there then um, he's uh, back uh, he, with his uh, friends, you know, going to treasure dig in Harmony, Pennsylvania again, and he go, he's going there to do that, you know, elopement. Um, after he elopes with Emma, much to um, you know his new father-in-law's uh, dismay, because he knows this young guy as only as a disreputable person who's a money digger and not a farmer. Um, uh, he, at a certain point, you know, to go down there, he, he promises his father-in-law that he's going to give up the stone gazing and money digging uh, and settle down to farming. They they make an arrangement to that effect, and he um, gets a little piece of property that he starts working on and starting starts wanting to farm. But it's that very same time period, just the next month, that Joseph is back in in, in Manchester, Palmyra, where he says he has obtained the the gold plates, and then it's the end of that year when. Uh, the dictation begins, you know, for the part that's now lost. Okay. A couple, a couple quick questions. Is that all right? Yeah. yeah. So um, I think it's important to note, and I don't, I don't want to overstate this or over dramatize it, but this is illegal activity that he's doing all along. So from 1820 to 1827, he's breaking the law, doing things that cause people to end up in jail. Is that right? Yeah, you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to um, do this kind of scrying. So the way the way you have to get um, in jail about it is uh, essentially what ends up happening is that the members of the Knight family who thinks that he's a fraud, you know, essentially go and they swear out a, an order to get him arrested, and then he's brought to court and that kind of a thing. Um, yeah, but it's but it's illegal. The whole thing it's illegal activity, right? Yeah, you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to. Um, pretend you're not allowed to look into glass and, and into balls and and tell people where to find lost things so and so this is and this is so this is a bit of a different image that we have than, than what we have of joseph smith growing up at least in the lds church you know we 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 see that he you know as a boy his leg was had the surgery and he refused the alcohol and then he studied the king james you know king james version of the bible and he reads the James passage and he has the first vision and, and he's trying to figure out which church is true. But, it, but the narrative that we've been told is always that he's this kind of earnest, you know, noble, righteous, valiant of a young man who ends up founding a church. And it's not to say that he's worse than dirt, but this paints a very different picture, which is that he was involved from a very young age in a lot of, shady illegal behavior I, I don't mean to pick on him but is that fair to say yeah so that so i've actually highlighted the treasure digging components of all this to show that it is like like you say one of the major activities that he and his family are involved in during this time period it does that mean that he also uh isn't an earnest religious believer so yet yeah, the problem like you say is not that um, the other isn't true that he didn't he did read and study the king james bible he did you know go to revivals he did probably i mean i think very likely he did uh pray and he maybe also i think had um envisioned uh envisioned things you know spirits that are religious as opposed to magic right so in other words that there is religious conviction too Right. Uh, but the problem, the problem here is that this portion of it is left out of the narrative, and so you're not getting the full picture. Is the problem not that the right. not that the component of the character is there? 
Just yeah. like there are dudes in the prison at, at Point of the Mountain who are very Christian and very religious, right? You can be, you can be a criminal and religious, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Another thing. So we know that likely the first vision story is something he wrote back into history. And we, th we think that because there's the first account we ever have of him actually writing it down was in 1832, right? Yeah. Um, is, is, and is there anyone who ever claimed to have heard him told that story prior to 1832 that you know of? We don't have, so we don't have the, um, so no, we don't have anything from that. You know, in other words, that goes from that time period, right? So okay. the, the, so it's not, um, so even though we tell that, it's, it's, and maybe I have the next slide even about this. No, I don't. Um, I was thinking I was gonna talk about, anyway, the, so even though we tell the story this way now, so um, in the kind of post-1844 universe, we you know, have in Latter-day Saint tradition, we almost always begin the story or you know, like at the pivotal moment is the first vision. Um, but this is not the way it was told or understood by Joseph Smith and his contemporaries. And so when my ancestors, like I mentioned, joined in 1832, 1833, they would not have heard the first vision story at all. That right, would not right, have been, right. If they had those kind of discussions, they wouldn't have heard about it. What they heard about was the Book of Mormon story. And I'm just wondering, is there any evidence that he ever told anyone about the first vision in the 1820s? The answer would be no, right? Well, I think, well, so they would have later recollections that maybe they did, but they don't have anything for sure that's contemporary from okay. that time period because he's not important and it's not a particularly important vision. Okay. Here's the, so here's the real question I was asking. When he is supposedly, you've got it here, 1823, there's a vision of a spirit showing him the location of the golden plates, and he's going back and returning to the site regularly. Yeah. Are there people at the time, is he telling people this at the time? Oh, it's, it's almost September 22nd, Mom, Lucy, or I've got to go back to that place where yeah. Andrew Moroni yeah, so are. That, so, they, so, that's, yeah, so that's much more well-known. So in other words, he is telling people at the time about the Moroni part. or not, He doesn't say Moroni, but anyway, about the gold gold plates so he is telling people about this later 1823 vision so that vision um, they are being told and in fact actually long before the um, the and you know the you know the he long before he says he actually ha obtains the plates he already is telling stories from the plates right so we have Lacey's um, recollection that um, you know one of the things that they did as a family activity is that Joseph would tell stories of uh, the ancient inhabitants and all their customs and wars and all that kind of a thing. So in other words, he's already practicing the oral story composition process um, in any portion of this four years between when he's announced that uh, the existence of the plates are in a vision and before he said that he has obtained the plates uh, in person. So he's got, and, and of course he's talking about plates I mean, I, I, I guess I shouldn't say, of course, but you would think that if in 1823, he's already talking about the gold plates that eventually, you know, he claims to translate the Book of Mormon from, does that mean in 1823, he necessarily has the idea of the Book of Mormon already in mind, that he's plotting that seven years before its release? So, or, is it, or is it a tale that grows? Yeah, so I would say that it, we don't know for, you know, we can't, be sure, but we can tell, we could definitely see evolution um, of the idea, right? So at early, um, there's a sense that he has that maybe other people will be involved in, in the coming forth or the translation of the plates and things like that. He's supposed to bring somebody with him to, to you know, achieve the plates. Um, when he gets to, uh, when he gets to Harmony, uh, with when he's married to Emma, Emma's pregnant. He foresees that he's, his first son is going to be a boy, and that the boy will, uh, as a child, be able to, you know, be the translator of the plates. But long before that um, uh, child is born, stillborn, and doesn't actually occur, uh, you know, that prophecy hasn't occurred. The the actual um, dictation process has started. So in other words, he's already started doing that. But you you get a sense of that that there isn't, let's say. Um, some kind of a master plan, but rather as circumstances are changing, um, you, ha you have already announced the sense that there's plates and, and over time then, you know, how that actually manifests changes. Certainly once the lot 
lost 116 pages um, were lost, then the beginning part of it changed, right? So, so there, you know, so it is responding to the circumstances. The fact that I mentioned before that in the Book of Mormon, there's the whole, um, the whole Anthon story is in the Book of Mormon. That obviously is a change from, you know, in, he wouldn't have written it like that in 1823, right? right. So what, what we kind of see is that there's a, an emerging, he has an emerging vision of what the result of this vision of buried plates is going to achieve. And the ultimate, um, you know, result of it is the Book of Mormon. But um, anyway, I don't, it's not because there's a plan as of 1823, I would say. Okay. So, but, but that, but that is kind of, if you believe that he just was the author of it and not, it, not it being a translation, that's kind of a long con, right? That's a seven year con basically of starting to tell people, Oh, I know about these plates and oh, an angel has been visiting me and oh, I'm bringing people to the site three or four times. Um, and, and so, so it is well, something that was envisioned so, so. very early. Yeah, but I don't. It, I don't necessarily think it has to be a con. So here's why. So in the same way that um, when you are being a seer and you're looking into your seer stone, your crystal ball, and you are envisioning a buried treasure that you know the location of Captain Kidd's treasure, you may well really believe that you know where that is. Um, you know his uh, his rivals. Uh, uh, have, they themselves don't. They see the vision of the plates as well. Um, you know. Maybe he's conned them into thinking that. But anyway, the, the, they think that they have it. They want to get a hold of the plates. They think that they've seen them in vision. So he may well, you know, have this sense that there, you know, that there are, that, that these plates exist, right? And that, um, and then from that, what takes shape is his understanding of what his calling to do with these plates is. And that, that changes based on, you know, again, where he is in life, his circumstances, and everything like that. Um, at some point or other, um, you know, like I say, there's no, one of the things that we can say when we get it past the visionary stage, so when it's beyond looking into the crystal ball and to actually holding, you know, a box where he says that the plates are physically nailed inside this box and you can lift the box up, then we, then we know that, in my opinion, we, that that's where, um, where you can say, you can't explain this any other way than he's created a prop. And, uh, and so there's some level of deception going on. So whether or not, though, the whole thing is some kind of a long con, I, I think that that isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily follow, although you can certainly argue it. There's no, there's no way to say that it's not, you know. Okay, but I mean, he's got the idea of a book as early as 1823, and he's telling people about it, right? Right. Yeah, and so the idea of the book is, is also, you know, very common, the same way as, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the money digging itself or the idea that the, um, that the ancient inhabitants who built all of these mounds um, had some high civilization uh, that is lost. And so the uh, local archaeological enthusiasts who are all, I mean, you mentioned Thomas Jefferson in this regard, Thomas Jefferson himself went and excavated one of the Indian mounds, right? And so he went through it and documented it and called upon other people to do the similar kinds of uh, archaeological or actually proto-archaeological actually grave robbing work you know you know it was not very scientific most of his successors in that Thomas Jefferson was of a different order and caliber than like the, the people who followed and so one of the things we're going to do when we talk about um, the Book of Mormon is talk about the contemporary belief in what's now called the myth of the mound builders and how um, the Book of Mormon narrative is in fact just telling what everybody understood at the time to be that very true history, um, but what we now understand, uh, having done way more history in archaeology and anything like that, was simply mistaken history. Okay. So in that sense, um, I'd say that lots of people understood that the history of uh, the ancient inhabitants of the Americas was the myth of the mound builders, and they all felt, as they were all digging up the mounds, uh, that the only way that they would be able to access that history is if they encountered that uh, a text that was um, buried with it, and that that would have to be engraved on uh, stone or metal in order for it to have survived. Or, I mean, the way Solomon Spaulding has his happen is that I think it's on parchment, but it's in a very um, secure you know, rock box or something like that. So in other words, how you're going to be able to get access to that history. But the idea of that history is quite ubiquitous. 
And so, and so if we can, if we can hold to our idea that the Joseph starts out in a world of folk magic and seeing and that sort of thing, and then we see that idea progress to the point where Joseph actually thinks he's receiving stories about angels and native Americans and their ancestors is, do you, do you see this as Joseph maybe throughout these 10 years believing that God is teaching him and telling him stories about real people that really existed and that Joseph is forming in his mind a story or a narrative, um, believing that he is going to actually find real plates and believing that he will be putting to paper these visions and stories that God is channeling into his brain about these mound builders and their ancestors. Do you think that's what's going on here? So I think that that case can also be made, yes. So in other words, I think that it's completely possible for us to think that he maybe is believing again in this kind of folk magic, uh, essentially the same way that scrying maybe works also uh, communication seance style with first spirits like Moroni, what's ultimately called Moroni, uh, also as I understood angels, whatever. Um, and then also ultimately channeling the divine voice itself, right? And so I think that um, it's possible that that kind of sense of channeling would be the same as, um, you know, in other words, there are some of the voices in him are saying that that's true and a true prophetic thing. And others might have been skeptical or might have felt that he was deceiving. And so at a certain point, um, the ones that are and justifies the means can take over and and say, since I, I can't take any more, I've got this true calling, but no one believes me. And so then the the you take over and make a prop that is, you know, not true, right? That is an actual this clear deception. So I think that's one possibility. It's also possible, you know, to argue that this that this is a long con. So I don't again we can't we, we, we lacking a confession on on his part, what I'm trying to do here is understand uh, how we can understand the guy within within the historical context that he's in, and I'm, and I'm arguing that because of the the way that we envision this now, so when we envision this whole thing as being really literal about all of these kind of uh, supernatural interventions and things like that, the way they're portrayed in 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 Mormon paintings and sculpture and movies, uh, that it becomes impossible to conclude anything other than what um, Gordon Hinckley would always say, which is either truth or fraud. Um, but I'm saying that the, based on this kind of folk um, magic slash religious context that this is coming out of, um, we don't necessarily know the level of how he understands these kind of spiritual practices. He knows that it's not um, visitations the way we are now picturing it in those kind of ways. But, um, but does he think that this is an actual spiritual or supernatural or even divine calling? It, it's, I think it's possible. So. Got it. Okay, great. Okay, so just to tie all those things together, you know, so we would already said how buried treasure has spirit guardians. So as a treasure seer, Joseph already envisioned spirits guarding the treasure that the money diggers seek. The spirit guarding the gold plates is envisioned the same way, you know, vision, which is to say not a visitation as it's always portrayed in the artwork. The spirit guarding the plates requires magic rituals to release them, visiting on the equinox, bringing particular people, having particular motives, all that kind of thing. And I'm just going to mention here on terms of this angel thing, so spirit, angel, Nephi, Moroni, I don't think it even matters. Uh, because but tell frankly, people what the controversy is. So um, people think that if, uh, so it was, the words are used interchangeably. Some of the, um, some of the early accounts were people talking about Joseph encountering a spirit and this kind of thing. Um, and obviously, um, in the same way that you want to write um, your power with the working with the rod out and make it be, you know, the power of Aaron, so that it doesn't seem as, you know, as uh, embarrassing folk peasant magic or something like that. And you want to write out seer stone and instead say Urim and Thummim because those are something in the Bible. So as you want to, as you're pulling out of the kind of common people milieu and the, and the embarrassment of that, people would like to when you get into um, more sophisticated circles if you want to you want to have a more sophisticated narrative to switching the word angel for i'm sorry you know wouldn't stop saying spirit and start saying angel but one of the the reality is anyway that mormons now what mormons now call angels so the word that mormons use they use the word angel for like angel moroni as an office meaning the office of a divine messenger 
And Mormons, I think, in Mormon cosmology view that as either beings uh, with spirit bodies, so essentially a spirit that hasn't been born in the mortal life yet, a uh, pre-mortal spirit, or someone who has died but not been resurrected. So in other words, um, you know, that that's either of those kind of people with spirit bodies can be angels because they are on a, a called to be a messenger for God, right? Or they could be a resurrected being who already has a physical body. So that's essentially what Mormons use the word angel to mean. Um, for those first two categories, though, I mean, usually they don't have the first category, but for that second category, in other words, of, of a being that has died and isn't yet resurrected. So, for example, if there was an ancient prophet, Moroni or Nephi, who had died and who was now coming back, even on a divine mission, what that being would be in normal or standard Christianity, Islam, Judaism, that would be a ghost or a spirit, not an angel, because an angel in those, um, in that cosmologically, in normal Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, it refers to a different order of being that exists somewhere between humanity and God in the celestial order, right? So it's not, in that sense, Mormons don't believe in angels anyway. So they believe in, um, they have a different understanding fundamentally and that spirits are called angels or whatever, but it's mostly, I would argue, that the reason why you want to use the word angel and not spirit is because if you're saying uh, that the ghost visit Joseph Smith, it doesn't sound, um, I don't know, I mean, it sounds worse, right? <laughs> so. Right, yeah. And so, and, and there was some confusing about who the angel was visiting Joseph, right? Right. So, yeah. So ultimately, all of these early angelic visitations. So um, Moroni, um, it's not in the earliest that we that, that he's given a name. It's later interpreted to be Moroni in some in one account or a couple accounts that there, you know, it's maybe interpreted to be Nephi, whether, um, you know, in any event, it's probably not a named spirit in the original in the original time at all that's not contemporary to it uh, likewise certainly the um the later uh, um uh, identification for example of the founding of the church um angelic visions that are ultimately labeled uh, john the baptist and the apostles peter james and john again those visions um of angels or spirits uh, were not identified with those names at that time. So it's only later that they're re-remembered and given if given those kind of names. And so... And, and, uh, and it, at one point it's given the name Nephi and then later it's given the name Moroni, right? Right. And I, I think it's, it's argue, I think you can argue it both ways on that. But in any event, I would say that the reality is, is that it's an unnamed spirit who's later understood by Mormon definition to be an angel, um, you know, who then ultimately people decide and, and, you know, is the, that the angel, the spirit that it was is Moroni. But okay. like you say, in some, of the, in some of the cases, it's Nephi. I don't think it's as strong as all that to say it was Nephi for sure first and then later Moroni. I think it's a little more complicated. But anyway, I think it's also kind of irrelevant. Okay. So essentially it's a vision. Well, it does show that the story's growing, right? That it's, it's always story the idea of a story where they're always adding to it and sometimes changing things. Well, so what, yeah, exactly. So what happens is, you know, it's, it's, to begin with, it is not a visitation, it's a vision. And when you're closing your eyes and you're seeing an angel or a spirit, it isn't, it isn't you know, so you can later, when you re-remember that event, memory changes every time you retell something. And so, uh, and so in that sense, because it's already a spiritual or ethereal thing at most, um, it's again, it could be re-remembered differently, you know, and the significance of it um, changes based on where you are at your time. So like, like I mentioned with the, the Peter, James, and John stuff, that vision is, you know, whatever vision there had been originally, which is radically remembered differently in the context when they later have a Melchizedek priesthood, and then it was, and then it's retroactively said to be uh, the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood. Um, that, same, that same thing happens with the sealing power. Uh, vision, which has nothing to do contemporaneously with the idea of sealing power, which hasn't evolved yet, but rather it's then later re-remembered to occur in Kirtland during a little after the dedication. So. Got it. Okay, that's good. To, thanks for clearing that up. That's good to know. It's an important. And, and the way, how do we tell that is because of anachronisms, right? So nobody contemporaneously knows that they aren't acting that way. So, for example, with the priesthood, um, 
they don't they don't immediately do all those priesthood things and in fact none of the early members have heard of those things and so you mentioned that same thing with the first vision so in the same way because the first vision hadn't had that kind of importance but was probably um, important to Joseph Smith as his own personal uh, born again or conversion story at that time period but was not seen as um, as an authorization to found a religious movement uh, it's only later remembered in that context when he'd actually had founded a religious movement um, so in that same sense none of the early people are remembering him talking about it at all and so actually all the way up through early founders of the church like the Whitmers have no recollection of that yeah and later they're like hey someone's making this up because I never heard about any of this stuff right um, and it just, it's just, it that doesn't mean that that vision, that a vision didn't happen. It's just that it didn't happen in the way it's now remembered and interpreted. Right. Got okay. It. So, um, like I say, whether then it's clear an angel, Nephi or Moroni, the vision is like, you know, all the other spirits and angels envisioned by early members of the church and their contemporaries. So it's not like this is the only time people see angels. There's all kinds of these early members that are seeing angels and angelic visions. We have times when they're seeing angels, everybody's seeing angels in the Kirtland temple when they're all even together, uh, you know? And so, and so how is that happening? It's because the scales are taken off their physical eyes. They're seeing the visions with their spiritual eyes, you know, when the veil is lifted and then they envision spiritual beings all around them. And in that same way then, just like with the money digging, these early Mormon counts are not unique. Um, the historical record is filled with you know, with this kind of thing. This is what, how people have done, right? So. Yeah, and that comes, that comes in later when Martin Harris admits that the witnesses didn't actually hold the plates with their physical hands and see them with their physical eyes. He basically claims that it was things they saw in their mind, like when you had me envision the sunset at the beginning of this podcast, right? Right, and we, see, we have other, every, every time when we, have, when we see the actual um, example of, of it, of it close at hand, it's like that. It's like what Martin Harris specifically described quite clearly about, about the, the vision of the three witnesses, but it's also like the vision of the three degrees of glory that happens with Sidney, uh, you know, Rigdon and, and Joseph Smith in the temple. In other words, that it's in, they're, they're there, uh, they're all around them, they're, they're talking about, do you see this? I see that, do you see this? That kind of a thing. So that's what I also, then we've already talked about this, but the first vision is also a vision, not a visitation. And so it's retroactively viewed as the origin of the restoration. The experience that's now called the first vision is largely unknown to early members, we've said. And the earlier, less anachronistic retellings of the experience, essentially Joseph has a vision in which God or Christ, one or two, two either one, is, uh, told him his sins are forgiven. And there are just lots and lots of contemporaries who have similar spiritual experiences. The, essentially, the context of Second grade, Great Awakening revival preaching is to try to get people to have this kind of experience. So the whole reason why uh, this time period invents essentially hellfire and damnation um, uh, you know, kind of preaching is to get people to convince that they have, uh, they're essentially in a sinful condition. They have no hope. They fall on the ground, as explained in all of the revivals that occur in the Book of Mormon, and they are then only lifted up because they feel in the spirit that they've essentially been uh, been born again, and their sins are forgiven them. And so that's how they have that kind of experience. And so, in that happening, they often record that they have a vision of God who tells them where Christ and tells them that their sins are forgiven. And and, and so this is something that we have, you know, anyway, at least dozens of examples that are almost identical uh, records so of. So we would grow up in the LDS tradition thinking, oh my gosh, some random farm boy in the middle of New York claims to have seen God, right? right. When, when in reality, he would have grown up with all sorts of stories of other people having visits yeah. from God or visions of God or visions of Jesus. And he would have been one of many, many people that would have made that claim. He would have gotten the idea of having a vision from God or Jesus from a bunch of other people who made the same claims and and it may not have even been that remarkable for someone to have claimed that back then. Whereas right. now we hear, oh my gosh, some little 14-year-old boy talked with God and Jesus. We're like, it's a miracle. That's never happened to me. But right. in some sense, it was actually really common back then, relatively speaking, versus today in a more secular society, no one's having those experiences, or at least you don't hear about any credible person having those experiences. And so it seems more remarkable when you hear about it now, thinking back then, when in, when in reality, yeah. when it was happening, it wouldn't have seemed possibly that remarkable at all. Is that fair to say? 
Sure, absolutely. So, I mean, what's happening at the time is um, this was a part of the whole second grade awakening. You wanted to get people to um, have this sense of a personal um, spiritual experience with, with the divine um, where you feel that Christ's atoning power or grace washes over you. And that's the only thing that grace or whatever is the only thing that makes you a true Christian and also makes it so that um, it makes it essentially so that, uh, you know, you're born again is what, what, what born again Christians call it now. Um, but that's, but essentially that the, in the initial circumstances, that's actually what's causing you to um, be part of the, that, the, that kind of uh, revival group, as opposed to um, just joining up by baptism, which is why, for example, in the, um, earlier part of the Book of Mormon, when King Benjamin is, um, uh, is doing his revival speech at the at sermon at the, in his reign, um, he isn't actually calling everybody to do baptism, but he's instead calling everybody to have this kind of born-again experience. And it's only later in the narrative that um, uh, the, when, with Alma that the idea of um, needing baptism uh, arises. So in some sense, we're thing, seeing the theology evolve throughout the book. Yep. Yeah. So um, anyway, like I've said a couple of times here, although we sophisticated people in 21st century want to draw these clear lines between folk magic and legitimate religion, maybe, or in, in the superstition, um, the Smith family was not sophisticated. I think they believe in the Bible, Christianity, folk magic, spirit, angels, God, Christ, dousing, curses, magic circles, scrying, visions both while they're asleep and while they're awake. And I think it's just all mixed up in, the, in, their, in their culture and also their own personal beliefs. And yeah. so the religious context that they come in, as I mentioned here, is this uh, second great awakening, the burned over district. Um, although, you know, up until that time, European Americans are largely committed Christians. There are some Jews, of course, but anyway, there are no real established churches, especially in the frontier. It's amazing, like the number of, like actual physical church buildings that existed as of the Revolutionary War was like just just a handful. I mean, it's crazy how few, you know, so it just hadn't caught up. Um, but this changed uh, dramatically with the um, Second Great Awakening, and especially get going in the 1800s and the 1820s. And we know that the area that um, the Smiths live in is called the Burned Over District, which is just rapid expansion of sectarian denominations. So the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians take off like nuts. And so this causes this religious division in the Smith family. And so both Joseph Sr. and Lucy Mac Smith are already skeptical of organized sects. And in fact, in the early, this version that we have of Joseph Smith's retelling of the first vision, he already knows by having done his Bible study that he feels that since none of the sects, since none of the Presbyterians or or Anglicans or Episcopalians. In other words, all the different groups that he's aware of are exactly like um, as he's reading about the, in the Bible. He already has decided that they um, don't represent the true Christianity, which is what his, both his parents um, believe. Uh, they instead have this earlier version of a personal study and relationship based on their own kind of reading of the Bible. But one of the things that happens uh, in their in, in his in Joseph Jr.'s lifetime is Joseph Sr. becomes convinced of one of these new teachings of universalism. Um, so we're aware of today of an heir of that, you know, Unitarian universalism. And so the idea um, that's becoming popular here is that no uh, just and merciful God, no merciful God could ever um, condemn a soul to an eternity of torment. Um, that, that, that just is out of, out of proportion. It's disproportional punishment for whatever 50% um, of doing worse than that good in a limited earth life to then have to suffer for, for all eternity. And so universalists argue that since that uh, doesn't reflect true justice or, or certainly not a merciful or loving God, um, that that's not the case. And that in fact, ultimately everybody would be, you know, achieve uh, universal salvation. Um, anyway, that's Joseph Sr. was attracted to that. Um, uh, but as you mentioned, that one of the issues maybe was, um, well, we'll talk about it anyway. In other words, that if you were, if you believe that maybe you were um, able to like live your life and excuse um, your drinking and things like that, because it, ultimately you don't feel, fear the hellfire is what people think anyway. So anyway, after though this uh, revival in the fall of 1824, um, the mom, Lucy, you know, Lucy and her three oldest children, including Hiram, um, become Presbyterians, and that causes then this uh, religious divide 
Um, Joseph Jr. later says he was partial to Methodism, and uh, Emma ultimately is a Methodist, and they go uh, to Methodist class together when they're married and living in harmony. But so anyway, we've talked about anyway that um, Joseph Sr. being a known drunk. So one of the practical arguments against universalism was this, the fear of hellfire was necessary to prevent Christians from maintaining sinful, idle lives. And so as we're going to see when we go into the um, Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon argues very strongly, Joseph Jr., I'm saying, argues very strongly against his father's Unitarian and Universalist beliefs. And as we kind of have in this picture, um, one of the things, I suppose we'll fast forward to kind of this, one of the things that happens in the historical record that we know is how much he weeps when he sees his father uh, uh, baptized into his own organized Church of Christ and healing the family sectarian division. Vision. So anyway, we'll, this is just a preview for the future ones. But that one of the motives for this whole thing is again this pi this pious end of of healing the family's division um, is also part of the part of the motivation for the whole Book of Mormon project. I love it. Yeah, I it's so. Um, I think that when we think about you know when when we learn when we feel like we've been betrayed by the LDS Church for not having taught us the real history. And we learned about polyandry. We learned about, you know, the Masonic influences on the temple ceremony and the book of Abraham not matching up with the translation. We just think, oh my gosh, he's a fraud. He was out for women. He was out for money. He was fooling people. But what, what you lay out is something that I've been feeling for quite some time. And I'm sure other people have really thought about this. And that's that Joseph Smith, like almost any prophet or, you know, religious inspired founder was grappling with very real existential sort of um, questions of the day. He had, you know, he had had siblings die. He had had, you know, Alvin wasn't the only sibling of his to die. He's having all these preachers come in who are preaching this, that, or the other is required to make it to heaven. So there's already this fear about Will I see Alvin again? Will I see my other dead siblings again? Who's going to make it to heaven and who's not? And then he's got this religious turmoil between his dad and his mom. His dad's a universalist, isn't much for organized religion. And the mom is flirting with different religious traditions. And, and so there's, there's this internal conflict in the family about which church is true and, and is it universalism or other things and what, if, is baptism required or not because Alvin didn't apparently get baptized. And so a lot, well, you know, just like, you know, em, you know, Emma noting that men are spitting tobacco in the temple, you know, leads to a revelation about the word of wisdom, along with all the different temperance movements that were going around Ohio at the time. You know, you need to understand the context to understand the revelation, understanding folk magic, understanding Smith family dynamics, peepstones. Tre guardians of treasures as angels, treasures slipping, uh, leads to golden plates, leads to this idea of a Moroni. L all these questions about mound builders and Native Americans leads to questions about a book that should be made or, or books that could be created to answer these questions. And, and then you see all the theology in the Book of Mormon eventually potentially stemming from the theological sermons that Joseph was exposed to, that Emma was exposed to, that Lucy was exposed to, the, um, <clears throat> the questions about mortality and an afterlife, you know, uh, all those sermons reappearing in the book, you can basically say, and this is something that we'll get to with the Book of Mormon, not only is the Book of Mormon not necessarily in and of itself a miracle, it's exactly the book that you would expect to be created if you were to understand Everything about the historical context of the 1820s in New York, Joseph Smith's own personal biography, and all the questions about Native Americans and all the religious debates of the time, it's basically all of this stuff we're talking about today is the soup or the milieu or the context that informs the book. Is that fair yeah. to say? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I mean, once you once you are aware of the context and have a little bit of also a broader perspective on just everything else, it's, it's so part of its context. It, it's, in my opinion, I just find it inarguable. So that's why one of the reasons why I jumped at your chance to, 
to talk about this because I'm just continuously amazed that people find it otherwise. <laughs> and so just, you know, going through and making that case. I do want to make the point here because um, you brought up, you know, some of the later issues that I am not here trying to be an apologist for Joseph Smith. So when, um, you know, when we're going to get to, uh, you know, if we, if we were to do the whole history and get to the end, you oh, know, we what, will, we will. <laughs> he's do Okay. So anyway, what he's doing, you know, with, uh, you know, just in, in general with um, uh, relationships with women in Nauvoo that he's calling marriages, including, you know, uh, when my great, 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 great grandparents gave, you know, their 15 year old daughter to him to be, uh, you know, a wife. Um, you know, this is um, nothing other than you can say abuse of authority at the at the most terrible level. Because here he is; he's every kind of authority. Um, you know, he's legal, military, <laughs> uh, civil, judicial. You know, prophetic. You know, everything in their in their life, and and this is how he's exercised that. So I'm not justifying that for a second. My and also I'm also not. Um, and when we were talking about the um, the particular verse in the in the Book of Mormon, where essentially the philosophical proposition of ends justify means is is essentially um, canonized, I also reject that personally, you know, as a as an ethical position. Uh, but what my goal in this um, is to try to understand the people, and so how we can, given what we know about all of this, how do we how can we best understand how this all fits together. And largely even in my trying to make explanations and, and, um, and essentially a window and try to have some empathy for the, our ancestors here in understanding where they're coming from. Um, in, in some cases, I'm not actually even doing this as, it's not about proof or not, because as far as I'm concerned, the, there are other places, and we'll talk about it, where we can show conclusively the Book of Mormon is a 19th century book. And so that's not what, you know, this is, a lot of these things are not um, or about that kind of proof, but rather what we're trying to do is how do we understand these reports, these stories, given what we know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just useful. It's just useful to kind of ground your worldview in the reality of the world and not in story or myth or legend when you have much better, more plausible, reasonable explanations for you know, for how to view something and upon which to base your worldview. It's a very different life if you believe the Book of Mormon is a historical document and that Native Americans literally come from, you know, Nephi and, and Lehi, and they're all truly the God's chosen, you know, Israelites with is blood, blood of Israel running through their veins. And this is God's one true book and you need to obey it and the prophets that you know, come out from it, that's a very different world than if you say, you know, view it as coming out of a very understandable 19th century historical context. That doesn't mean there can't be value or truth in it, but it's a very different foundation of a life when you see it for what it is versus maybe ways in which you were misled as to its founding. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what I would say on that is that they're like you're saying, the the problem is not um, finding and deriving meaning from uh, sacred story or myth. Even you know we can we can find um, presumably amazing truths in Hamlet. Uh, the problem is when we take uh, we take something that's not not history and then literalistically believed. Um, you end up with a worldview that is much like Joseph Smith Sr.'s, where you really do believe that Captain Kidd's treasure is around the bend, you know, and you can, you know, lose the farm based on, you know, that incorrect literalistic belief, right? Yeah, totally different. Well, cool. Well, this, I think, so is there anything else you want to cover today, or does this kind of cover what you had prepared for today? Uh, I think so. this is what I had covered for today. <laughs> Perfect. But yeah, there'll be I've plenty more to do because I want to, you know, kind of get into um, just why, you know, backwards and forwards. Uh, I don't want, on the one hand, I just, I mean, anyway, why I don't think that the Book of Mormon is, why, why we have to be so, you know, amazed by it on the one hand, <laughs> and, and or the why people, you know, have to come up with conspiracies to uh, decide that Joseph Smith couldn't have composed it. So, yeah. So, so what, what do our listeners have to look forward to, our listeners and viewers, 
what do they have to look forward to in our next uh, episode? So the next episode, I want to talk about the, um, the rest of the kind of um, American context where we're going to look at what were the, uh, the theological or doctrinal um, controversies of the day. Uh, because then that'll also, you know, we're not familiar with those uh, anymore, except for in as much as they have lived on in Mormonism as fossils, because essentially most uh, mainstream Christian tradition churches have moved on and they don't care about the particular issues that were um, driving everybody crazy in the 1830s. Likewise, those same um, ideas like universalism and every other kind of thing hadn't been dreamed of um, just a century or two before. Um, but in any event, they are completely um, the context of actually understanding the theology and doctrine of the Book of Mormon, which is ultimately um, related to the later development of Mormon doctrine, but is actually not the same at all. The Book of Mormon isn't, doesn't have so much of what's the essentials to, anyway, LDS or Utah Mormon doctrine, things like, like you mentioned already, temples, uh, eternal ceiling families, all those things, a, uh, a, a you know, a non-monotheistic idea of progression theology, as opposed to the modalism uh, that exists in the Book of Mormon, a very different idea of the divine itself. So anyway, so we'll look at all those kind of things so that we can kind of see, you know, where all those come from and fit those into the context too. Yeah. And, and if I had to say what I'm most excited for, it's John Hamer's theory of how the Book of Mormon got created. Okay. Yeah. And that one too. And then, and yeah. And so, so we'll also look at, um, rumors of Joseph Smith being illiterate and that kind of thing. <laughs> so, All right. Was, well, I, well, John Hamer, I just want to, is there any shout out you want to give or any, any sort of plug you want to make to our listeners before we sign off? Cause yeah. So if, um, if you are interested in some of the, all of the different kinds of topics. Uh, so for example, every Tuesday night at um, my congregation's website, which is center place spelled the Canadian way, which is R E centerplace.ca. Um, every Tuesday night at 7.30 Eastern, I will give a lecture. And this following Tuesday, I'm actually doing one on, on medieval science and sorcery. And so all those things that we talked about in terms of the four humors, uh, astrology, alchemy, we're going to actually like look at those and look at um, how they had evolved in the Middle Ages and what their ancient classical precursors were. And so um, I think it'll dovetail very nicely in what we've been talking about in terms of the commoner folk magic that derives from that kind of um, medieval understanding. So. All right. And uh, of course, if anyone wants to check out Community of Christ, they always can, right? Of course. How's, give give <laughs> us an stop. update on the Seekers program if there is one. Well, um, so one of the things that, um, you know, we've been one of the things that we're trying to intentionally do uh, in Community of Christ is that because so many people um, are finding that they are, don't have a spiritual home in the faith tradition that they've grown up with. So, for example, um, you know, just because of the limitations of the role that women have, um, the ongoing policies of exclusion in the LGBT community, um, Many people have come to Community of Christ to see, you know, what are, what are your restoration cousins? What is it actually kind of like? And so that program of kind of intentionally responding to that kind of um, seeking, uh, we've called in Community of Christ Latter-day Seekers. And so if you are interested in, um, in that, in other words, if you are seeking, you know, a spiritual home, an alternative within the restoration tradition where um, you don't have to, let's say view all of these origin stories literally, you don't have to, um, uh, all of the different things that, you know, uh, obedience to authority, all the different things that are re related in terms of the LDS tradition, you can, you know, check us out and see what um, an alternative uh, expression that has the same heritage. Um, but as I've always said, um, everybody in my view, we're no, we don't claim a community of Christ to be the one and only true church or that there is such a, a thing. Rather, um, we're all, in my view, in life's the pilgrimage of life. Uh, there are all kinds of different ways that we approach uh, the questions that you talk about, our ancestors struggling with the questions of life and death and meaning, uh, of uh, connectedness, of what our goals are, what's good and what's evil, what, you know, what are we trying to promote in terms of making a better society. And people around the world and all the different traditions have different ways and different valuable ways that they address it. 
uh, whether you're Buddhist, whether you're Hindu, whether you're an atheist. And so you don't have to, you know, have come on, you know, you don't have to follow the path that I'm on. <laughs> I don't expect you to. Our principle in community of Christ in that sense is unity and diversity. So, um, so we would be very welcome, but you're also, and you're welcome to uh, see what we're, what we're about. But if you end up um, being, feeling called or your life is moving in a different path, we also will um, welcome you on your way in that direction. So. And websites people can search for all this good stuff? Um, latter day, I think latter-dayseekers.org. And okay. that'll, that'll give you all the links you need. And what about, oh, and that's to your, to your Toronto congregation? To the Toronto congregation, um, you can go to centerplace.ca. And uh, actually, you can spell it either way because it redirects. But anyway, centerplace.ca. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Yep. Well, Thanks, John, John Hamer, you're a gift to Mormonism. So it's such a thrill to have you back. And I can't wait to have you back again soon to tell us how the Book of Mormon got created and other wonderful things. All right. I'm looking forward to it. Talk to you again next week. Keep up the great work, John. Thanks. And listeners, thanks for tuning in to Mormon Stories. Check us out at mormonstories.org. If you value this type of programming, please go to mormonstories.org. Click on the donate button, $10, $20, $100 a month, whatever you can afford helps to keep uh, this podcast going, the Open Stories Foundation going, um, and all the good things that we do. Uh, we really appreciate and need that support. We're grateful for Cody Layton, who does our post-production, our editing, and for the Open Stories Foundation board that uh, keep, the pod, keep the Open Stories Foundation on the railroad tracks moving forward. Thanks, everyone, uh, for your support. Please tell people about this episode. Please share it on social media. Like us. And uh, give us a positive review on our Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page. Please give us a positive review um, on iTunes, a five-star review that helps in our ratings. And, of course, follow us on Instagram, Mormon Stories. Um, also on Twitter, Mormon Stories. And, uh, yeah, please just share the word and help, help other people learn about this stuff. Thanks to all our donors that have made the billboard possible. If you're driving along I-15 going north, Around 3,200 South, I believe, you'll see a Mormon Stories billboard there. We had several donors donate to make that possible. That'll be up through the end of December. And we just want to thank everyone for making that possible as well. Our donors are amazing. And, and as long as you guys keep supporting us, we'll keep doing great work. And please look forward to interviews with David Bakaboy, more interviews with John Hamer, and uh, many other cool interviews coming up. Uh, we're going to uh, keep bringing you great content for as long as we have support. So thanks again, everybody. Take care. Oh, I, I thought of another interview before you just sign up. Um, uh, I was just at the Parliament of World Religions with uh, Matthew Bolton, who is the son of uh, Apostle Andrew Bolton in Community of Christ, who last year won the, um, his group uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for their work in banning, you know, getting nuclear weapons banned. And so I'd like to bring Matthew on. Uh, so we, cause it's an interesting Mormon story. You're going to want to hear about that. I think I can't wait. I can't wait. Okay. John. Thanks for everything. Look forward to more partnership in the coming weeks, months, and years. Loving it. Bye. All right. Take care.